Okay, we're going to get started, so I'll ask everybody who's out in the hallway to filter back in. Um, our first speaker uh, for the next hour is uh, Adam Schwebach and uh, Josh Mady, um, and they together will be speaking on uh, traumatic brain injuries, which is a really big topic, um, and they'll be discussing other uh, things like neuropsychiatric testing with that. Um, also wanted to mention that the sponsor for this talk is, uh, uh, comes from the uh, Ron DeLear Memorial Fund, which was created last year when Ron DeLear uh, passed away, who was a longtime member of this uh, society for over 20 years. And so she sponsored this uh, talk. And uh, so join me in welcoming um, Adam Schwebach and Josh Mady. Welcome everybody <coughs> to our presentation. I am Josh Mady. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to be talking about management of traumatic brain injury in primary care. Um, here are disclosures. Uh, just to tell you guys a little bit about myself, I am a doctoral candidate in psychology at Utah State University. Uh, I'm also a graduate assistant at the Neuropsychology Center of Utah. Uh, the majority of my research to date has looked at epidemiological factors related to cognitive aging and dementia, dementia progression. I've had the opportunity to work with the Cache County study on memory and aging. But today, we're here to talk about traumatic brain injury. So hopefully we can touch on uh, these key points today, cover some information regarding them. First, I'd like to provide a brief overview regarding neuropsychology and neuropsychological assessment, uh, especially as it relates to traumatic brain injury. Then I'm going to discuss the relevant research uh, and data related to traumatic brain injury uh, with the focus on adult mild traumatic brain injury as these folks are uh, going to initially present in uh, primary care most often. Lastly, Dr. Schwebach uh, will follow with some evidence-based recommendations related to the management of mild traumatic brain injury uh, in primary care and discuss when referral to neuropsychological services is recommended. So to begin, what is a neuropsychologist? Uh, our role involves a diagnosis, management, and care of concerns uh, related to neurological disorders uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, so things like uh, ADHD, autism, uh, looking at seizure disorders, traumatic brain injury, as well as uh, late life disorders such as uh, neurodegenerative diseases and Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, broadly, neuropsychologists are clinical psychologists who have received special training beyond the PhD uh, in brain and behavior relationships. Uh, namely in the areas of structural and functional neuroanatomy, uh, neurological disorders, and neurodegenerative diseases. Because of the foundation in behavior and social sciences, uh, neuropsychologists often conceptualize from a holistic perspective. So looking at the biological, the psychological, and the social factors uh, related to a patient's concern. Uh, they're most widely known for neuropsychological assessment and that uses an evaluative method to define patient concerns and assist with treatment planning. Uh, so in the private practice setting that I'm currently at, typically we meet uh, initially with the family uh, and the patient. <coughs> then the patient um, for an intake and history session, and that is followed uh, by an appointment of anywhere from three to five to eight hours of uh, standardized testing looking at cognitive, emotional, and personality factors. Uh, and that's concluded with a uh, patient feedback session uh, where we go over the results of the evaluation and assist with treatment planning. So depending on the setting, neuropsychologists are also actively involved in the uh, treatment of patients, especially in cognitive and psychologically related treatment. So cognitive rehabilitation or psychotherapy services. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, at the end of the presentation regarding when it is appropriate to refer for a neuropsychological evaluation um, if patients have experienced traumatic brain injury. So now to provide a little bit of background. Um, traumatic brain injury is a vast topic. There's a lot, um, a lot of research looking at the various severity levels and the various outcomes related to that, but I'm gonna briefly uh, touch on them. So traumatic brain injury is defined as a disruption in the function of the brain through an external force, such as a blow or a jolt or penetration of the head. And the operative word um, is being disruption in the function. So in theory, a patient with a positively identified lesion who do, let's say, do a fall, does not have any uh, subjectively identified or objectively measured complaints or disruption in brain functioning technically would not meet criteria for a TBI. It's unlikely that that scenario would happen, uh, but it's important to understand that conceptualization of a disruption in function, especially when we discuss what it constitutes a mild traumatic brain injury. So several clinical signs are also noted regarding a TBI, namely a loss of consciousness, a <coughs> excuse me, post-traumatic amnesia, neurological deficits such as abnormal reflexes, balance and coordination, uh, nerve weakness or decreased sensation, and an alteration in mental state such as disorientation and confusion. So the severity of TBI is usually classified across three levels, mild, moderate, and severe. And there are several diagnostic criteria that are used to determine TBI severity. However, <coughs> they can uh, differ slightly depending on the context, such as an ER room versus a research context versus a primary care setting. But the criteria most often used are the durations of loss of consciousness, alteration of consciousness, and post-traumatic amnesia, as well as a Glasgow coma scale um, at the time of injury, usually within 24 hours of injury. So for example, <coughs> this slide breaks down uh, the diagnostic criteria of mild traumatic brain injury. <coughs> and this was developed by the American Congress of Rehabilitation. These are the most widely known uh, criteria for mild, mild traumatic brain injury. But they emphasize that the severity of injury does not exceed a loss of consciousness greater than 30 minutes, a Glasgow coma scale between 13 and 15, and post-traumatic amnesia that is no greater than 24 hours. So it's important to note that the severity of a head injury should only be determined at the time of injury and not at some later point when a client presents. So it's not much of a concern for moderate or severe traumatic brain injury as those uh, individuals will most likely be monitored through a hospital stay, but it does come into play uh, with individuals who've experienced a mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, because they are at higher risk for attributing non-specific symptoms uh, to a head injury, such as headache or dizziness, confusion. Additionally, mild traumatic brain injuries cannot always be corroborated with objective tests or medical personnel, uh, and this may create issues with diagnostic accuracy. Also, traumatic brain injury in general has a high diagnostic threat. And that means that patients tend to lump mild traumatic brain injury into the same category as a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury and thus uh, exacerbating beliefs of limited recovery from a brain injury. Neuroimaging has also been used to assist with diagnosis and prognostic indicators of traumatic brain injury. Uh, CT scans are most often used <coughs> due to the speed and the cost and their ability to detect uh, trauma and fresh bleed uh, or skull fractures. MRI is sometimes ordered uh, when increased resolution is needed to detect subtle structural changes. There's also experimental methods uh, used to detect the sequela of uh, brain injury. Diffusion tensor imaging is an MRI sequence. It's used to detect white matter disruptions such as diffuse axonal injury, and that is the shifting or shearing or twisting of axons um, 
as the brain shifts rapidly within the skull. So there are limits to the diagnostic and prognostic utility of neuroimaging in TBI. Namely, <coughs> TBI severity does not always predict positive neuroimaging results. And positive neuroimaging findings do not always predict uh, the treatment and the course of a traumatic brain injury. <coughs> when somebody experiences a TBI, there are several ways that the brain can be injured. Some of the following are directly related to the injury, such as penetration of the brain, concussive force, uh, contusions or bruising, coup and counter coup. Um, that's when the brain impacts the skull on one side and is then shifted uh, through force to the other side, resulting in a secondary injury. That is uh, illustrated here. It's often seen with blows to the back of the head, causing the temporal poles and the frontal poles of the brain to come in contact with the sharp ridges of the skull uh, inside. Um, some of the remaining injuries are secondary to the initial traumatic injury through cascading events potentially, but also through swelling, bleeding, rash of oxygen, uh, intracranial pressure, a mass effect or the structural compression or shifting of the brain due to uh, bleeding or uh, increased cerebrospinal fluid. And then finally, infections. So to talk a little bit about the prevalence and the incidence of traumatic brain injury, these data come from the CDC uh, 2015 report to Congress, uh, and they were collected solely using emergency department visits. So in 2010, there were about 2.5 million TBI visits uh, to the emergency department. And the vast majority of those visits, about 87%, uh, were treated and immediately released. 11% were hospitalized um, and later discharged, and about 2% of those patients uh, were fatal. Because these data only looked at emergency department visits, they are likely underestimated because they do not account for individuals who did not even seek medical care or who sought medical care from an outpatient clinic or through a federal agency. Some of the risk factors found within these particular data are age and possibly a sex difference, um, such that males tend to have higher prevalence of traumatic brain injury. Uh, several age groups showed higher risk, such as younger children, adolescents, and those age 75 and older. Older adult adults show the highest risk of traumatic brain injury, us usually resulting in falls, uh, which is the largest category uh, determined by these data. There are also uh, categories of being struck by or against an object, uh, motor vehicle accidents and assaults, as well as an unknown or other category. This graph is a little bit difficult to read, uh, but it shows the historical trends of the emergency department visits from 2001 to 2010. So towards the right side here, uh, there has been an increase uh, starting in 2007 of nearly 60% in the total emergency department visits related to TBI, though the number of hospitalizations and deaths have decreased slightly. So therefore, the vast majority of the increased cases are assumed to be increases in mild traumatic brain injury. And this may reflect several reasons, such as an increased uh, campaigning efforts to educate the public, regarding the importance of a traumatic brain injury evaluation. But it does also highlight the need to provide evidence-based treatment regarding uh, brain injury, especially with a mild traumatic brain injury. It would be very interesting to see how these data progress uh, over the last 10 years, especially with the increase in media coverage um, on brain injury. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the course of TBI. I'm going to briefly discuss some of the outcomes related to moderate and severe TBI. But again, the focus is going to be on mild TBI. So in general, the course of TBI is conceptualized as dose-dependent, meaning that with an increased TBI severity comes a longer or more complicated uh, recovery. And this serves as a useful clinical conceptualization but TBIs are highly variable in their nature and their course, especially in moderate and severe TBI. 
But nevertheless, TBI recovery can include things uh, such as cognitive difficulty, emotional personality changes, physical challenges and impacts on daily living, uh, such as within family relationships or employment status. So as noted before, uh, moderate and severe TBI is highly variable, though there are some common patterns regarding recovery. Mortality is often seen uh, in severe TBI as high as about 40%, uh, but much less is seen in freak, uh, uh, lesser severities. Individuals who experience a coma often progress through a series of somewhat predictable stages uh, of consciousness, so from a coma to a vegetative state, to a minimally conscious state, and then to a confusional state. And the vast majority of comas related to uh, traumatic brain injury last four weeks or less. And as an individual progresses through these stages, if they have experienced a coma, it is possible for them to um, sort of stall out at any one of the stages, though it's very rare to see uh, patients remain in the vegetative state. Functional outcomes have also been measured in moderate and severe TBI. So using the Glasgow Outcome Scale, good functional recovery has been seen in about 70% of moderate TBI patients and 50% of severe TBI patients at a two-year follow-up. So good recovery on the Glasgow Outcome Scale does have a few caveats. Uh, it's categorized as no assistance needed with activities of daily living, um, acquiring employment, and then possibly having minor uh, neurological and psychological deficits. Additional research has shown return to work rates across moderate and severe TBI between 20 and 60 percent, um, and independent living in approximately 70 percent of individuals with moderate and severe TBI. 24 percent of those uh, receiving part-time care and about 7 percent needing full-time care. Now, mild traumatic brain injury is somewhat harder to study than other severity levels of TBI, and the research um, is focused on uh, numerous outcomes. Uh, it's due to the reasons mentioned before, so such as lack of uh, seeking medical treatment, highly variable and nonspecific symptomology, and potential diagnostic error. However, the overwhelming majority of research on mild traumatic brain injury supports a complete recovery from an initial and even research showing a subsequent uh, mild traumatic event, typically within three months. So in a meta-analytic review of studies examining cognitive measures between individuals with mild traumatic brain injury and controls, uh, authors found no difference in effect size on those cognitive measures at three months post-injury. However, those who presented to a clinic in the chronic phase, so beyond three months post-injury, and those who were in litigation showed significant differences up to a year, and that may emphasize the influence of other factors uh, related to recovery beyond what is naturally seen in the population-based studies. So this slide is a little overwhelming on purpose, but it shows the many factors researched that are related to recovery of traumatic brain injury, including pre-injury factors such as demographic characteristics, employment status, pre-injury psychiatric status, and substance use. Severity variables also have a prognostic value, including the initial uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, time to follow commands, and duration of post-traumatic amnesia. Cognitive and neurobehavioral impairments, such as early cognitive and functional status, uh, executive functioning, and post-injury depression and anxiety are also associated with TBI recovery, as well as environmental supports, such as family or caregiver factors, uh, and brain injury rehabilitation, so enrollment in programs like that. Furthermore, neuroimaging and physical impairment may predict recovery. Now, while there are numerous factors related to the recovery of TBI, research supports a shift in the influence over time, meaning that the factors most relevant uh, to uh, a TBI at the time of TBI are often the severity variables or the neurological or biological factors. However, as recovery duration progresses and time from injury to outcome becomes longer, 
injury severity variables become less important in the shift to addressing factors such as those associated with premortal functioning or their current environmental supports, the psychosocial variables become more important. And this is further emphasized in research that shows uh, premorbid characteristics and cognitive and functional status at the time of injury was more predictive of functional outcome uh, than injury severity variables at one year post-injury. So I would like to conclude my section of the presentation uh, with a sentiment that is often heard in my clinical work, in that if I get a brain injury, my life is over. And there are indeed many factors related to recovery, but I believe uh, the counter argument by Bellinger and colleagues uh, highlights the cumulative research, especially as it pertains to mild traumatic brain injury in that despite the complexities um, in any one person, however, the general rule is recovery over time. So I'd like to invite Dr. Adam Schobach to talk about that and go into a little bit more detail. Okay, thanks Josh. He did a good job, right? He's going to get his PhD sometime. I'm convinced he will get it. He's been at our office for some time. Josh does a great job. We have a relationship with Utah State University and their graduate program, and um, we have a number of graduate students that come down and do what's called a graduate assistantship. So when you're getting your PhD, it's, it's not as easy as getting your medical degree. And so we have it rough. We have to do this dissertation. We have to do all these graduate assistantships, and so Josh is there doing that. And he and Kat, who are our two graduate assistants right now, they do a lot of our adult assessments for those people who are coming in with um, mild cognitive impairment or dementia or some kind of differential diagnosis related to that. So Josh, thanks for your help with this presentation. Um, I did tell Josh this morning when I first walked in, the speaker up here was in a suit and a tie. And I was a little nervous about that. And then I think the speaker before that was probably in a suit and tie. And I'm not a suit and tie kind of guy. And my son, who is just finishing his AP psychology class at Davis High this year as a senior, reminds me every day that I'm not a real doctor. So I don't have to worry about wearing a suit and tie when we give presentations. So just a couple things to recap as we talk about this. I, I know most folks in here um, who are, are, you doc are ER doctors in here, Heather, Heather, hi. So the ER doctors, you guys are going to see a lot of these mild TBI cases, these concussion cases. The primary care physicians, we know you see them. You're going to see those ones where it's somebody that had a little bonk on the head in their soccer game, and then they're in your office, and you're like, okay, I've got to sign something off here and get you to return back to play. And so it's, there's a lot of variability when you see these folks. And again, we wanted to focus on mild traumatic brain injury because that's the majority of who you're going to see in a primary care type of uh, setting. But just a quick note here, just a quick synopsis. Again, as Josh mentioned, the recovery of mild traumatic brain injury, the probability is extremely low that someone is going to have persistent problems associated with a mild traumatic brain injury past the three to six month mark. And as you can see from this slide, you know the majority of people are gonna get better within a, a week maybe about 10 days. And then usually within a month or so, you have kind of what we call these slow recoverers. But there was a really good study done in 2004 uh, through the World Health Organization that demonstrated that the probability of someone having long-term deficits, meaning long-term cognitive impairment, long-term uh, neurological deficiencies, long-term challenges that are associated with a mild concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury, is about 1.8%. So if you see someone in your office as a primary care physician and they're coming in three months post-injury, eight months post-injury, especially 10 to 12 months post-injury, I want you to be thinking about this slide that the probability is more likely that you're dealing with some type of underlying psychiatric issue or a mental health problem or other factors like pain. Chronic pain is not good in mild traumatic brain injury. So the folks that we see that are probably having the most difficulty with quote unquote recovery are the folks that have been in that car accident, they had a whiplash injury. I'm not disputing the fact that they had a mild traumatic brain injury, but they're telling us that they're having pain 
my neck hurts, my back hurts, I damaged my knee in the accident, and the chronic pain seems to be one factor that really inhibits recovery. I wanted to touch base a little bit on this concept of post-concussive syndrome. And post-concussive syndrome, it actually used to be in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the APA manual, it used to be in the manual, and then they took it out of the DSM-5. And the reason why they took it out of the DSM-5 is because it, the post-concussive syndrome, or PCS, is a very ambiguous, you know, quote-unquote diagnosis. There's a lot of debate now, especially in the field of neuropsychology, about what really is post-concussive syndrome. Post-concussive syndrome is this very complex terminology that's used to describe a set of symptoms that may persist approximately three months post-injury. So technically, you cannot receive a diagnosis of post-concussive syndrome prior to three months post-injury. And we see lots of cases where folks have had a concussion, they had a mild traumatic brain injury, they've gone and saw the physician, and they're maybe two weeks post-injury or a month post-injury, and the physician is telling them you have post-concussive syndrome. And the reason why we're going to talk about this is because there has been a lot of research that one of the factors that, that helps to improve recovery is the language you use as a physician. Whether you use language such as you had a concussion or you whether you use language that you had a traumatic brain injury or whether you use language of saying things you have post-concussive syndrome. And there has been a lot of data supporting that when we use certain terminology, it can either inhibit recovery or actually promote recovery based just on the terminology that we use. So this PCS is a very common diagnosis. It's one that we typically see very frequently, our patients coming into our office, but it's one that's often misdiagnosed. And I think the key factor to the misdiagnosis is it's diagnosed what I would consider to be premature. It's where somebody's coming in, like I mentioned, a couple weeks post-injury or a month post-injury, and we're telling them they have post-concussive syndrome. Whereas, again, if you go back to the previous slide, most people with a mild traumatic brain injury are going to get better within three months. Spontaneous recovery is actually the number one factor of recovery. So we need to be a little careful, and it's a little premature to use this term as a diagnosis. It is now believed that post-concussive syndrome really is more of what we would consider a psychiatric construct and not necessarily an organic construct, meaning the symptomology the patients are typically reporting has more to do with underlying mental health challenges, premorbid psychiatric issues, chronic pain is another variable, depression, anxiety, and those factors often lead to this misdiagnosis. One case example, there's a neuropsychologist by the name of Iverson. He did, uh, he's done a lot of research actually on post-concussive syndrome, but one of the uh, clear studies that he did is in 2006, he did a very well-controlled study where he had patients going into primary care clinics, and these patients had depression, but they had never had a traumatic brain injury. And they had the patients fill out rating scales related to post-concussive symptoms. And the majority of those patients who had never had a, a traumatic brain injury, 90 plus percent of them reported symptoms that were consistent with post-concussive syndrome. And over 50 percent of them actually met, quote unquote, the diagnostic criteria for post-concussive syndrome. But these patients had never had a traumatic brain injury. They'd never had a concussion. But their symptom reports were very similar. Things like, I feel dizzy, I can't focus, I can't concentrate, I'm feeling irritable, I can't remember things like I used to, my memory is impaired, I'm having difficulty recalling words, I can't sleep at night, I have no motivation, I have a lack of energy. Those are things that these patients were reporting which are very common symptoms in what we see with depression. So we have to be careful in this particular diagnosis, keeping in mind again that with post-concussive syndrome, what we're really seeing is that spontaneous recovery is the rule of thumb, and this is a really ambiguous diagnosis. And the factors that contribute to post-concussive syndrome usually are pre-morbid functioning, so pre-morbid or pre-existing psychiatric challenges, a history of psychiatric difficulties, and one factor that's really important is the mindset of the patient, which Josh mentioned is very important. And I, I had a woman, I'll never forget this woman, she was a very bright woman, she came in a couple of years ago, 
for an evaluation, and she was referred actually by her insurance company. It was a workers' comp compensation case, and she slipped and fell on the ice at work, and she hit her head, and she went to the ER, and they said, yeah, you had a, diag you had a mild concussion, and she goes home, and she started to develop a lot of these uh, very challenging symptoms. But she had this long-standing history of anxiety and particularly post-traumatic stress disorder due to a history of trauma in her childhood and adolescence. But it was very challenging for me to convince her that her brain was actually okay. So we did a full neuropsych workup. All of her test scores, all of her cognitive abilities, they came back in the 90th percentile or higher. This was an extremely bright woman. No memory impairment, no executive functioning impairment. But she continued to tell me that I was wrong, that th there is something wrong with me. So the mind is a very powerful tool. It's a very powerful thing. And so the mindset of the patient, their expectation of what may or may not happen following an injury often contributes to the development of post-concussive syndrome. And I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Again, we really should avoid using the term post-concussive syndrome prior to three months post-injury because, again, most of those patients are going to get better within that three months. And, again, the diagnosis may actually inhibit one's recovery. There are a number of uh, conditions that will mirror post-concussive syndrome. Number one is going to be depression. Chronic fatigue syndrome is another one. Generalized anxiety disorder is another one. Sometimes even individuals who have a history of learning disabilities, they will report symptoms that are very similar to post-concussive syndrome. And the last factor is pain. Pain, again, we'll talk about pain, but people who are experiencing chronic pain, those are the ones that we're going to have probably the most difficulty with. Those are the ones that are going to have the most challenges when it comes to recovery. So what do we want to do in terms of recommendations in managing this and managing the, the uh, folks who have a mild traumatic brain injury? Number one is education of patients regarding the high likelihood of full recovery is critical. And there has been a lot of research looking at folks as they come out of the emergency department, particularly the emergency department. And folks where um, there was a, a very good study where they looked at using the term concussion versus traumatic brain injury. And the folks who had gone to an emergency department and the ER doctor said you had a concussion, those folks had a much better recovery versus the folks where the ER physician said you had a traumatic brain injury, right? Now, this is not to mean to be critical of the terminology that we use. And, of course, as you guys do a great job in the ERs and in your private practices. So by no means am I being critical. But I want you to think about how this education of the patient and the terminologies we use develops the mindset of the patient. And the mindset of the patient is going to help with their recovering outcome. So patient education, again, patient education, particularly at the time of injury in the ER, are very close to the proximity of injury, a few days post-injury. Educating the patient is one of the factors that helps predict the recovery down the road. So when we are telling patients that, hey, the good news is, yes, you had a mild traumatic brain injury, but the good news is you're going to get better. And in fact, the likelihood that you're going to get better is 98%. So helping the patient understand that, that they're likely going to have some symptoms, they're likely going to have some challenges, it will help to promote their recovery. If the patient comes into our office and is saying things like, I had this concussion a couple weeks ago and I'm not doing well and I'm having these headaches and I'm having all these balance issues, we're not trying to minimize what they're experiencing but we have to be very careful about the terminology we use and to help the educate the patient that they will get better, that they will improve, and that the probability of improving is very high. In neuropsychology, we use this term neuroplasticity. You guys have heard of this term. And neuroplasticity, of course, is promoting the fact that our brain will make new neural connections and recover. And I often give patients a, an example a few years ago I had some health problems, and I was struggling with lots of diff difficult things and a lot of different challenges. I was having a cervical neck issue and all kinds of central nervous system problems, and Rachel Hobbs, who's my doctor, she's here, did a really great job of helping me with this. And then eventually I found out that I had some kind of issue with my vestibular nerve. And I'd walk down the hallway, and I'd like have to put my arm up against the wall, and I was having all these balance issues. And, and then I consulted with one of my friends who's a physical therapist, and we did 
couple months of vestibular rehab therapy, and it worked wonders, right? And, and now I'm fine. I'm not standing up with my hand against the wall. So things are a lot better. So I sometimes will tell patients the story of neuroplasticity and help them appreciate that you're going to have some symptoms, but your brain's going to recover. It's a great organ. It's going to get better. We have a lot of evidence to support that. So the language we use is very important, and the education is very important. We do want to be careful of diagnostic labels like, you know, telling people, you, well, you're a person with a traumatic brain injury or you have brain damage. And again, I would caution using the term post-concussive syndrome because then that patient's going to go home and Google that, and they're going to read a lot of uh, things about that. So we want to be a little careful with that particular diagnosis. We do want to emphasize that one of the factors that helps with recovery is, in <coughs> fact, engagement. So there has been kind of the old additive of you have a concussion, you have a traumatic brain injury, we want, we want the patient to go home and do what? Rest. That is old news, okay? And this is where maybe it comes with some controversy. But we have found that rest is not best, and especially prolonged rest. So prolonged rest is can be our Achilles heel. There was a very good, well-controlled study that came out looking at sport-related concussions, and they divided participants into two groups. One group was prescribed rest. You have to go home. You have to turn the lights off. You have to close the blinds. Don't look at your phone. Don't watch television. Don't do anything. The other group was prescribed engagement, returning back to engagement with symptom management. So these folks were actually encouraged to rest for a day or two, but then to get back to school, to get back to work, to get exercising, to get doing things and get moving. And the one thing they were prescribed is brisk walking. So they were prescribed brisk walking in the study. The participants who were prescribed, prescribed prolonged rest, not only did they not get better, they got worse. And the participants who were prescribed engagement with symptom management got better much faster than the other ones and made a full recovery within that two to three month window. So we have to be very careful with prescribed rest because prescribed rest, it does a couple of things. One is it promotes depression. So if I'm telling you to sit in a dark room and close the blinds and do nothing, it's going to make you feel and think very miserably. And then it creates the patient mindset of, I must have really got hurt and I'm not going to get better. I've got to stay here and do nothing. And if I look at a screen, it's somehow going to damage my brain, right? And it's not going to happen. Nowadays, you guys know this as physicians. You know, remember in the olden days when people would go have like a surgery or something, they were in the hospital for like weeks at a time. I had a woman come see me last week who had just had hip surgery. She had a hip replacement like two days before, and she's walking in my office with a hip surgery. Right, And I remember when my best friend Steve, his dad had a hip surgery in 1993, and he was in the hospital for two and a half weeks. Right, So what are we telling patients now? We want them up. We want them going. We want them moving. We want them doing things because there's a few things the activity does is engagement does a couple things. One is it gets oxygenated blood to the brain, which helps repair. Number two is it helps to promote this mindset of recovery. So we've got to be very careful with how we're telling patients rest. Symptom management will be key with these folks. So what will happen is you'll tell patients, yeah, you rest for a couple of days, but then I want you going back to school, but then the patient comes back and says, I can't go to school, I have this massive headache. I can't focus on my schoolwork. All right, well, let's manage the symptomology. Let's see if we can reduce your schedule, but I still want you going back to school. Well, I'm trying to exercise, Doc, but when I exercise, I get really dizzy and fatigued. I know. I understand that. So we want to try to promote engagement while managing the symptoms. Physical therapy can be very beneficial for these folks if they need a little bit of help with that. But engagement is key to help promote recovery. In terms of referring to neuropsychology, I can tell you on our end, you know, most cases – we don't want to see them until they're maybe three to six months post-injury. There are other neuropsychologists in the community that may differ on that. I can tell you at our office, if I have a patient come in and they're a month post-injury, I'm not really going to do much to them other than education. 
I will educate them on what's going to happen with mild traumatic brain injury, what can we expect from them. Sometimes we get a lot of skewed data when we do testing too early. So a neuropsychological evaluation, we typically don't recommend that in the acute phase. We're usually recommending that six months down the road, for sure six months or a year down the road. And if you have a patient that's with persistent symptoms, we want to rule out things and we want to take a look at what's maybe prohibiting their recovery. Um, again, with the referral questions, the degree of the cognitive or functional impairment is things that we look at. And one of the things that we're going to do in a neuropsych assessment is really at the end of the day, we're focusing a lot on differential diagnosing. You know, is what we're seeing related to a traumatic brain injury or is what we're seeing related to other variables, an underlying psychiatric problem or an underlying psychiatric condition or chronic pain challenges, and how can we help manage those um, symptoms is going to be key for them. So that's something that we'll do on our end. We have seen that in terms of recovery from mild traumatic brain injury, one factor that has actually been more powerful than cognitive rehabilitation has been cognitive behavioral therapy. And in fact, cognitive behavioral therapy has been found to be about six times more beneficial to reduce symptoms like post-concussive symptomology than cognitive rehabilitation. Tosh down in Salt Lake does an excellent job of cognitive rehabilitation, but the literature has been focusing more on cognitive behavioral therapy because a lot of what we're doing is helping to educate the patient in CBT, helping them understand their mindset and how their thought patterns could be contributing a, a lot to their symptoms and overall challenges. Now, there has been a growing body of, I guess, interventions that are co uh, computer-based interventions or these brain rehabilitation type programs. A very popular one down there that I'm going to throw out is the Brain Balance Program. There are other programs throughout the Valley that kind of promote these rehabilitative, computer-based rehabilitative programs. And when I was training with Dr. Goldstein down in Salt Lake, he, he used to use this motto that I've kind of stuck with for years. And the motto has always been he would divide interventions into three categories. And he would divide them into science, non-science, or nonsense. And that was something that's always stuck with me. Now, I'm not saying that some of these programs are complete nonsense. Some of them are. But the majority of them are not complete nonsense. However, the science has not been very beneficial. And if you look at the research, which has been very consistent, if the literature over the last 30 to 40 years has been consistent, that the probability of you recovering from a mild traumatic brain injury is 98%, and that the majority of people with a traumatic brain injury get better just by doing nothing but getting up and walking and living their life, so meaning spontaneous recovery helps them the most, then why would I send them to a program that's going to cost them $25,000 or $10,000 to help them get better following their brain injury? So that's where my criticism lies, is that I think the science hasn't been great with these programs, and at the end of the day, there are things that are a lot cheaper that are going to help you more than anything, which is education, physical therapy, engagement with symptom management, and those are the factors that are going to help folks improve the most when they've suffered a mild traumatic brain injury. The only other thing I want to add as we get to questions, these are references if you want to look at them, but I think one thing I would add is um, coming back to the concept of the neuroimaging. One thing Josh did mention with this is that with neuroimaging, it's a very useful tool, but neuroimaging alone does not predict impairment or a prognostic outcome. I've seen folks with very significant issues on their neuroimaging, but they're doing just fine. And the other factor I just want to add, which Josh touched on very quickly, was you have to keep in mind that the severity of a mild traumatic brain injury is determined at the time of injury and not at a later point in time. And so this is for folks in primary care. If you have a patient come into your office and they had a, a traumatic brain injury, they had a concussion, and they are coming to see you three months later or four months later, and you're doing your evaluation, you have to be very careful if that person has never went to the ER, they never were evaluated immediately following the injury, they never were seen by a primary care or an Instacare physician, so we never had a really good workup immediately following that injury. We have to be a little careful and cautious in terms of what's contributing to that symptomology. 
that is where we often end up in litigation for these cases is because we have folks that are three months, six months, eight months, ten months post-injury reporting problems that they believe are then tied back to that traumatic brain injury when the severity of that brain injury, one, may not have ever occurred, or two, the severity was very, very low. So in those cases, keep that in mind as you're seeing those patients months or weeks down the road with their injuries. We have about 10 minutes, nine minutes for questions. Um, given that kids are returning to school, uh, what about returning to sports? So the returning to sports, as many of you know, there there is a protocol now that many of the um, children have to go through. If they have a concussion, they've got to follow some protocol. Oftentimes they need permission from the physician. And usually what the permission from you or myself has to be is not necessarily permission that they get right back into sports. It's permission that they can start back with the return to play protocol. Those are two different things. So you're giving them permission to say, yes, I think you're healthy enough, you can get back into the return to play protocol. Again, the literature, the really current literature has shown us that we want them engaged in that return to play protocol very quickly, but we're leaving it up to the school or to the athletic uh, trainer for them to then follow through and actually finish that return to play protocol. What about the cumulative uh, effects of multiple brain injuries? Yeah, I think it's wise to tell patients don't get more than one brain injury. I think that's a good <laughs> idea. Um, one factor that to kind of coincide with that was we do know that there is risk when patients are in recovery, meaning they're in this maybe this one month window or two month window or three month window. This is where the return to play protocol has come out, we really want you to be careful and not get another concussion or a head injury. That's not good. And then secondly, more importantly to your question is, of course, the cumulative effect is, is not good. Now, we do know that if you've had one concussion, it does place you at a higher risk of having another concussion or mild traumatic brain injury at some point in your life, and it will slow your recovery. So the research, the, the data statistics we were showing you are for folks who just had one traumatic brain injury, one concussion, one mild traumatic brain injury. But for some folks, if you've had multiple concussions, your recovery will be slower. It reminds me of a woman I just saw, a very nice lady. She had a, a pretty good concussion when she was playing college soccer. And then now years and years later, she's a mom. She got another pretty good concussion playing soccer again. And her recovery has been about, we're about 10 months into it now. And so she's getting better, but her recovery's been slower. So we, will s we do see that compounding impact on that. And of course, if you're worried about those folks, those are folks that we do want to see in neuropsych because we want to make sure there's not any other significant problems happening. So, yeah. I'm a retired ER doc and now working with uh, Dr. Goldstein. He's my partner. Uh, I think this is the most up-to-date, best balanced presentation I've ever heard on mild traumatic brain injury, and I congratulate you. Thank you. Uh, I have one comment on terminology, though. I don't like the term concussion anymore. I prefer contusion. Everybody knows what that is. Uh, I think concussion is ambiguous, and it sets people in the same mindset right. as a traumatic brain injury. Right. Thank you. Uh, anoth another comment. Um, Thank you for bringing up the issue on rest. I've just seen several where they were put at three months complete rest a year after diagnosis. Uh, and that is still common in this community. But thank you very much. I think this was just absolutely sterling. Great, thanks. I have a question. Being primary care, you'll have people come into your office and want medical disability because of a traumatic brain injury. Right. And so obviously, they can't even come in unless this has been going on for what a year, six months. Uh, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of you know subjective data. You know, they come in, their X-rays are negative, everything's negative. It's just what they're telling you. You know, when they come in and they want you to fill out all this paperwork. So right. can, I, can I safely say, hey, give it another year or give it a you know? I mean, what do you do with these patients? Well, I think, you know, Josh loves these patients because he sees a lot of folks that come in through a, a Department of Health tr uh, fund that we're on. So these are folks that have had like a concussion like five years ago or 20 years ago, and now they're applying for SSI or disability. And 
I mean, we we have a mindset at our clinic. We want to help folks, and we're gonna we're gonna help you the best we can. But if you get someone in that kind of area where they're coming in and they need a disability, at the end of the day, I think you have to refer them for a more comprehensive evaluation. And if, if their injury has been months and months ago, we're happy to see those. We, and neuro, as neuropsychologists, every neuropsychologist, we have instrument tools that measure malingering, feigning, over-exaggeration. We have those instruments in place, and we're more than happy to take a look at those folks and determine do they really need disability or not. The other thing is, you know, since a lot of these symptoms are so vague, would putting them on an SSRI or low dose benzo be detrimental? Well, the only challenge with the benzos is the benzos are going to kind of create more cognitive impairment. Now, putting them on a SSRI might not be a bad idea. If they're having some issues related to some pain or anxiety particularly, it could calm things down. The only concern I do have with the benzos is benzodiazepines actually inhibit neuroplasticity. So they'll actually inhibit recovery, and it could create more co uh, cognitive cloudiness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of patients will tell me, well, I c I'm having cloudy thinking, and I can't focus and concentrate. Sometimes I'm worried the benzo is doing that. So but an, an anti-anxiety medication might help. Okay. And then you're saying, you know, the chronic pain is a big issue, too. Yeah. But yet they don't want you to use opiates because that can affect the cognitive uh, abilities. And then probably gabapentin or Lyrica is going to do right, the same right. thing. So what do I you do to use treat the pain well pain i'd send them to pt physical i would have, have them work with a physical therapist okay. and see if that physical therapist can help do some interventions to get that pain under control that would be a good good okay. option for them okay thank yeah. you yeah wondering if you can just comment on the community resources for neuropsych testing cognitive rehab and and vestibular rehab so vestibular rehab therapy, to my knowledge, and again, somebody speak up if you do this somewhere here that I just don't know, is going to be usually through physical therapy. Uh, most of the physical therapists that I'm aware of do vestibular rehab therapy. Cognitive rehab therapy, the best place that I know that does that is Tosh. I do believe that the University of Utah Concussion Clinic also does do cognitive rehabilitation therapy down there. And again, someone correct me if I'm wrong on that end. In terms of neuropsych assessments, of course, we do that here. Uh, Dr. Chris Jansen's at Tanner Clinic. He does neuropsych assessments and sees a lot of adults there. Um, up in this area, the, we're, I think, the only ones that do adult neuropsych. Dr. Jennifer Cardinal does do neuropsych assessments as well, but I believe she focuses primarily on pediatrics. Does anybody else know a neuropsych up in Davis or Weber County that I'm not mentioning? Oh, yeah, Mark Cordiat. He does a lot with chronic pain, so he'll do a lot with pain and a lot of folks, a lot of adult folks, so he'll do chronic pain TBI as well. So that's another resource. He's off of by behind the target, the super target in Layton. So there, are, oh, it seems to be that the uh, military has really brought on the TBI thing with everybody getting blown up over in the uh, war zone. Right. And there's lots of secondary gains to these guys coming back with, uh, with uh, uh, disability ratings based on TBI. My problem working down at Hillfield is we get all the people that come in for a new job, they list on their thing that they've had a TBI, and I have no idea what it means, you know, for them and what their impairment is. We're trying to figure out can we do the job today, right? The new job, and they all say, no, no, I'm fine now. But uh, y you always wonder what's the, uh, you know, wi with major TBIs, and I think that they have probably used a, a rather broad brush approach. Oh, I fell off the back of a truck and I have a TBI versus the one that got blown up, you know? Right. So I, w I wonder if you have a comment on uh, on maybe um, the use of the terms and how we can differentiate uh, from a distance uh, mild TBI from others. Well, I think the biggest challenge, again, you know, comes back to what Josh mentioned, is that we have to remember that the severity of that TBI has to be determined at the time of the injury. But you're seeing folks that either they might have had an incident years later, and I have seen – Lots of folks where they're diagnosed with post-concussive syndrome but were never seen by a physician or a practitioner until two years after their you know, supposed concussion, and that becomes a, a really big challenge. I think you know, it, it, part of your question is what can they do today? Sometimes if they're having impairment, we need to take a look at what's the differential diagnosis of that. And again, I'm not trying to sell us. I'm not, I mean, we're busy enough as it is, and we definitely appreciate your referrals, but a neuropsych assessment can help you with that. A neuropsych assessment could help you with differentiating, is this really uh, TBI problems or is this associated to some other factor? 
and the mild kid, the mild folks where they didn't lose consciousness, they had an adequate Glasgow Coma Scale score, their post-traumatic amnesia was fine, they don't really seem to have significant challenges at the time of the injury, their recovery is very, very, very good. And even the military, your question reminds me of a guy I saw was a Marine kid in Iraq, this was years ago, and he was up in a tower and they're shooting at some guys and somebody shoots an RPG at him and he sees the RPG coming at him and it hits him in the side of the head and it doesn't explode and the guy gets knocked out for like two days, he's in a coma, they life flight him to Germany and the guy was doing just fine, right? I mean, when I saw him two years later, he was like doing great. So the, ma the challenge of traumatic brain injury is that you've seen one patient with a TBI, you've seen one patient with a TBI because their recoveries are all different, so yeah. I have a question about CTE. The question is, I have a nephew who uh, died of drug overdose, a suicide type thing, uh, with severe chronic traumatic encephalopathy from playing football. My question, and he had 11 known concussions. I want to know what primary care doctor should do in a case of that type of situation where maybe a boy comes in, plays high school football, maybe has two concussions, is there anything that advice we should do or what can we do about those kind of situations? Well, given your level of comfort and expertise, I, we're either going to refer them to neurology for a full workup or to us for a full workup. I have seen kids like that where they've had s five, six concussions that come into me their junior year in high school wanting to play football at Utah State or the Y or something like that, and we have to tell them, I don't think you should do this you know, because of what we're seeing on their test batteries. So it is definitely something to be very cautious about, coming back to the earlier question of multiple concussions. We don't like to see that, especially when people are symptomatic. So if they've had multiple concussions and they're reporting symptoms, that's even a bigger issue, you know. So we want to we want to take a closer look at those. And I think as a primary care physician, you know, what you're going to want to do to manage that is either refer them to specialty to have us – take a look at that or yourself have a discussion about the dangers of multiple concussions over time. Yeah. Thanks for your time. I'm one minute and 10 seconds over, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schwaback and uh, soon to be Dr. Mady. Um, for our next speaker, I'm gonna invite uh, Randy Steinfeld to uh, introduce.